John chapter 6, um, I want to talk this afternoon about Jesus, the bread of life. We see at the start of John chapter 6, um, a miracle, in fact the only miracle that's recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, um, it's the only one that's in all four, there's many miracles described as what Jesus did, but this is the only one in, in all four. Um, often called the feeding of the 5,000. It says in verse 5 that Jesus had said to Philip, when there was this huge crowd of people who'd been following Jesus, listening to his teaching, and they're there in a remote place, and they actually need some food. Otherwise, you know, they'll have to go home and get some, or they'll be flagging, you know, maybe passing out some of them. So Jesus asks Philip, he said, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And Philip starts to think, about you know, how practically you're going to feed. And he, he said, you know, if we were to, to feed this lot, you'd need 200 denarii's wages, which is like 200 days' wages of, uh, uh, you know, what would that equ equate to? At least 10,000 pounds, perhaps. So where are they going to get 10,000 pounds worth of bread to feed all these people who were, who were here gathered? But it says in the text that Jesus said this to test his disciples because he knew what he was going to do so if you're familiar with the story uh, they find a young boy who's got five barley loaves and two fish they bring it these to Jesus Jesus takes it and he gives thanks to God for these five loaves and these two fish and then he tells his disciples to go out and to distribute uh, this food amongst all those people who are in this great crowd it says in Matthew's Gospel, we're not given the number here in John, but it says in Matthew's Gospel, those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. So, you know, we talk about the feeding of the 5,000, but how many it could have been? It could have been at least 15,000 people, maybe more. Who, who knows how many people were fed that day? But Jesus does this amazing miracle. And what's the response of the crowd? It's not the sort of thing that normally happens, is it? That you just suddenly get food from, from nowhere. Suddenly this great multiplication miracle. The response to the crowd is that some thought he was the prophet. Now when we're talking about the prophet, this is probably a reference back to the Old Testament to a book called Deuteronomy. Uh, Moses, the great prophet, the one who'd been sent by God to speak on God's behalf throughout the whole of the Old Testament, or at least you know the early section of the Old Testament, um, really the story of God's redemption. M Moses plays a huge part as God's prophet. But it says in Deuteronomy 18:15, "The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me." This is Moses speaking. From among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. So, in one sense, the the crowd are right that the, this prophecy about the prophet that's going to come, like Moses, is pointing to Jesus. But they're limiting Jesus and just thinking that he's going to be another prophet, just like Moses, i.e. just a regular man who's been called by God to speak the words of God. But anyway, they see him as this great, great leader. They want to follow another one like Moses. You know, especially one who will provide for them wherever they go. And so it, it says in verse 15 that they wanted to take him by force to make him king. They wanted him to be their king. They wanted him to, to lead them <coughs> and to provide for them, which is a very human thing, isn't it? We all want our immediate needs, our physical needs to be met. And if you can see someone who can do miracles like Jesus, then why not have him as your king so that he can provide for everything you want? They'd clearly seen something about Jesus that was different from the average person. I just wonder, when we think about Jesus, who's Jesus to us? Is he a prophet? Is he a king? It's pretty impossible, really, if you were to read with an open heart, read through the Gospels, the four Gospels, which speak about the you know, the story of, of what Jesus did. You'd have to be pretty blind or ignorant 
to read through that and think that this Jesus is just an ordinary man. You read through it and you think, well, either, either it's made up and it's a great fantasy, or actually if it is about a real man, there's never been anyone like him ever on planet Earth, nor will there be anyone like him to come on planet Earth. There's something special about Jesus. Who do you say he is? Do you say he's a prophet, a king, a miracle worker? Well, Jesus wanted to, to show them perhaps something more um, about this miracle. The miracle had really had been there to, to get them to think. Jesus, in the, in the dialogue that he, he has with the, particularly the religious leaders in John chapter 6, he declares that he's come from God, which is quite a claim in itself. Moses never claimed to come from God. You know, we can read about Moses' parents. He was born just like everyone else, but God chose him and called him and said, I'm going to use you to speak my word to the people. Whereas Jesus doesn't, you know, claims more than that. He claims that he's actually come from God. And his whole challenge, the whole reason why he's done this great miracle, is to get them to think about who he is and to believe in who he is. Verses 30 to 31 the crowd actually come to Jesus and challenge him. They say, then what sign do you do that we may see you, see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread, sorry, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So he's talking, he's looking back, <clears throat> people there are looking back to this manna in the wilderness. <clears throat> What's the manner in the wilderness? Well, there was a time when God's people were led through the wilderness. So they're there, similar to the story today that we're reading. They're in a remote place, but this was really remote. There was, they couldn't get any access. It's not like they could just send people home to, to go to the shops. They were in the middle of nowhere. And as they're going through the wilderness, as God's leading his people through the wilderness, the people are hungry. And they're starting to remember the food in Egypt from which they've come. And starting to harp back, oh, do you remember the food we used to eat? Isn't it wonderful? And they start to grumble against God. Why should we follow this God who takes us away from good things in Egypt and brings us into the wilderness and then starves us to death? This is basically what they're accusing God of doing. So God miraculously provides this substance called manna. We read in Exodus 16 about this manna. It says, when the dew had gone up, so early morning, when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. So God had just provided, miraculously, this substance, this manna to appear on the desert floor every single morning. Jesus compares himself to the manna and he compares himself to Moses. But in his comparison, he says that he's better than both. Verse 32 says, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So the, the manna was described as bread from heaven, and it was. It came miraculously, bread there appearing on the desert floor by God's hand. No one had done any work in providing it. God had just given it bread from heaven. But Jesus describes himself as the true bread from heaven. Both breads are from heaven, both Jesus and the manna. Both breads satisfied physical needs. Jesus has just satisfied 5,000 men plus women and children in this crowd that they all ate and were satisfied. <clears throat> um, it says about the manna in Exodus 16, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. In our text it says they all ate their fill. So physical needs were met in the same way. But the people had come to the point of thinking, okay, maybe this is, this is Moses reimagined, Moses revisited, Moses marked too. 
Maybe, you know, we're going to have a great leader like Moses to lead us, who will provide for us, who will give us all the things that we need. But Jesus challenges them in that because they're just thinking on a purely physical level. Just thinking about their own particular needs there. It says in verses 26 and 27, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labour for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. He was challenging them. Why are you following me? Is it just to fill your bellies? The same challenge comes back to us. Why do we have an interest in Jesus? Is it just for this life? Is it just because we get lonely and we need someone to talk to? Is it just because we need someone to provide for us, someone to protect us, someone to lead us? And he will do that gloriously in this life. But if it's just for this life, it's just, if it's just for a bit of help in this life, to say, God, can you help me to get through this life, to cope in this life? If it's just that, then we're missing the point. Just like these people. It says in verse 13 that they were all filled and they, they gathered up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. There was more than enough for their needs, an overflow of their needs. But even if you could have overflowing prosperity in this life, or overflowing health, overflowing peace in every situation, would that be enough? Is that why Jesus came? Just to give you all these blessings in this life? They'd eaten their fill, but they'd missed the sign. Jesus was talking about the life after he was talking about eternity. He was talking about beyond this life. What comes after when you die? Verse 49, it's there on your sheet, you can have a look. It says, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died, which is true. God sustained them through that food for that period, but there was a time when they died. It, didn't, it couldn't keep them alive forever. Whereas in verse 51, Jesus declares about himself, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. He goes on to say, verse 54, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus is clearly saying, in, in declaring that he's greater than this bread in the Old Testament, this manna, he's saying that that manna just kept you alive physically for a time period but then they all died or is he saying if you eat the true bread from heaven i.e himself then he's, he's saying that you will have life forever he'll give you eternal life and he says he'll raise you up on the last day now the last day is a reference to judgment day that you know on that day when jesus comes back to judge the world will all be raised before him. All those who've died will come and stand before him. All those who are still alive will come and stand before him. This is the last day. But there's two destinies on that last day. Some will be raised up to life. Others will be raised to shame and everlasting contempt. Cut off from God himself. And all the blessings of all the good things of God. Only those who've eaten this true bread from heaven will be raised up on the last day. Only people who've truly eaten of this true bread from heaven will have eternal life. Will know that when they die, that's just the, the gateway into to the fullness of life. Life with all the bad bits taken out. Life with God, life in his very presence, walking with him throughout eternity. But it's only those people who've eaten um, this bread of life. 
So how do we eat? How do we feed on the true bread from heaven? I'll read you a couple of verses. Let's see if you can spot the word. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. That's verse 35, verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So there's two, the same thing said in two slightly different ways. One is that if you come to Jesus, the other one is if you come and you look up to Jesus. But both of them have then the same verb. You come and believe. You look up and believe. You come to him, you see him, but you believe in him. This is how we feed upon this bread from heaven, through faith, by putting our trust in him. So what exactly are we saying that we're to believe? To believe that Jesus is a historical figure? Yeah. To believe that he's a prophet? Yeah. Well, he is. To believe that he's a king? Yeah. Well, he is. Um, but then Jesus changes the language somewhat in this idea of believing. You know, those things are what the, the crowd believed, but yes, yet they missed the point of why Jesus was doing this miracle. They believed he was a prophet. They wanted to make him king. They believed, obviously, he was a historical figure because he stood there in front of them on that day. But they missed the bigger point. Jesus changes the language of believing and he takes it into a whole different level. Verse 54, have a look. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Suddenly the language has got a bit nasty it's got gory it's become a bit more uncomfortable the thought of sitting down and eating fresh bread is quite appealing but the thought of sitting down and eating human flesh and drinking human blood is now becoming offensive he's taking it to another level he's taking it to a level that if, if we're just following Jesus for this world we're thinking, that's offensive, I don't want anything to do with that flesh and blood bit. Why would I be doing that? Because Jesus had to go deeper than this world. He had to truly enter into the true problem of humanity, the problem of sin in this world. So when he's talking about his flesh and he's talking about his blood, he's talking about the, a clear allusion to him going to the cross. It's not just about believing that he's this nice man to follow, but to believe that he is this man who's going to be battered, who's going to be whipped, who's going to have a crown of thorns placed on his head, who's going to be walking, carrying his cross to the point of exhaustion, who's going to be stripped naked, he's going to be nailed hands and feet to a wooden cross. This is the bit that the people were missing. This is the bit where Jesus is showing the depth of the need of humanity. We don't just need someone to help us through this life and just to improve our life here on earth. We need a saviour. We need a substitute. We need someone to die in our place so that we can live. And he tells us to feed upon him. To feed upon his flesh. To drink his blood. This isn't a casual thing. It's not a I go to church now and again type thing. It's not a I go to church and I receive communion. Or I go to the mass you know, and receive the, the wine and the wafer. To bring it to that level is a complete un insult. This is something primal, it's something vital, it's something down to earth, it's something life-giving. It's something that's not superficial, something that's not just to be added on to your life. But it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of exchanging one life for another. It's a matter of us coming to the cross of Jesus Christ 
and we being crucified and receiving all the benefits that we can from his crucifixion. It's about dying to self. It's about exchanging life with Jesus. If I want the life of Christ, then I come and I give my life. I don't just add Jesus onto my life and try and retain it. I give the whole thing. I come and I eat his flesh and I drink his blood. I come and I'm willing to go through anything to have everything stripped from this world that I might have eternal life, that I might be raised up on that last day, that I might be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. To eat his flesh and to drink his blood is for Jesus to become our life, our everything. Why do you live on this earth for Jesus? Why do you do what you do? I do it for Jesus. Why do you do that for Jesus? Because he lived and he gave his life fully for me. He loved me that much that I'm to give my life to him in full surrender to him. Some people find this offensive. Certainly the people in the crowd, most of them, the majority of them that day, found Jesus' talk offensive. It says in verse 60, When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Verse 66 says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. When Jesus asked his disciples, are you going to turn away? He said, to whom else can we go to? Because you have the words of eternal life. You may find the cross of Christ offensive. You may find the idea of, of Jesus being everything offensive. But if you do, if you walk away, you'll never know this eternal life. When you're raised up, on judgment day you won't be raised to life you'll be raised to condemnation this Jesus is the only way to be forgiven this is this Jesus is the only way to receive eternal life it's hard how can we do it verse 44 the interesting verse there Jesus says no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him now that word literally means to drag. The work of the Holy Spirit. He goes beyond our humanity. The, when we talk about the cross, that this is the only way of salvation, it just seems ridiculous. But the Holy Spirit, he, he testifies that this is true. That this Jesus is the Son of God. That this Jesus truly did die in place of sinners, lost sinners. He truly was crucified to take God's punishment upon himself. The Holy Spirit comes and he draws men and women. He drags them. He convinces them that they are sinners, that they, are, they will stand before God, that they need to fear God. But he also wonderfully declares to them, it helps, enables us to believe that Jesus is the only source, the only saviour, the only answer to the problem. The only source of eternal life. Back in Exodus 16, talking about the manna, it appeared on the desert floor early morning. But it says, morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as it could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. There's a sense there that the manna was only there for a short season. Jesus is stood here in John chapter 6. The people are following him. He was walking through. Some of them may never have seen him ever again. That was their moment to come and to trust in him. For us, anyone who might listen to this, our days are ebbing away. They're melting like the manna in the noonday sun. 
We can't keep putting these things off. We have to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe upon him for salvation. And when we do believe, we have to keep on believing. Again, um, Exodus 16, Moses said to them, in terms of gathering the manna, let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. So the idea was that God was teaching them to rely upon him for their daily bread. If we've believed in Jesus, this true bread from heaven, it's not just a one-off thing. There's a sense that every day we come back to the cross of Christ. Every day we need to come to Jesus and receive what we need from, from, from him to live the life that he's called us to. He tells us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, to, to, to pray for our daily bread, fresh daily bread. If we don't continue walking with Jesus, then somewhere along the line, there'll be worms and bad smells. Because what will happen is that we won't be living in the power of God anymore. We'll start to live in our own humanity, which stinks and is disease-ridden. We need to come daily and feed upon this true bread from heaven. Blessings every single day. Every day until that day. The day he comes, till judgment day. And then for the believer, we'll be raised up into glories that we could never think or comprehend. That will last forever. When you eat of this bread of life, he gives you everlasting life.